I'm Jamila King. I'm news editor of Colorlines.com, and this is your panel on mobile democracy. And we're going to be talking to some very smart and engaging folks today about how to use your mobile phone to leverage your political reality. Um, joining us, we have Jed Alpert, who's the founder of Mobile Commons. We also have Rachel Labruyere, who's the director of mobile strategy at Mobile Commons. And before that, she worked for Reform Immigration for America, which was an awesome mobile, which had an awesome mobile campaign. We also have Josh Levy from Free Press and Catherine Mayer from the National Democratic Institute. Um, but before we get started, I want to get a general sense of, of what y'all have done with your mobile phone. So who's used their mobile phone to engage in political work before? Like who's text messaged a campaign or so? Few people. Um, so I have a new one for you. And this is just a real quick idea to see how quickly this works. Um, so at the Applied Research Center, we have a campaign called Drop the I Word, and it's a campaign that's working toward getting the word illegal out of common usage and usage of the media. And so real fast, I want y'all to text the number 69866. And after you do that, you'll be on a list and you'll be able to get information about Drop the I Word campaign. Um, it's real simple. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but if you want to, we'll love you. I Word. So I word as one word. Six nine eight six six. I word. I word all one word. So you should get a confirmation text basically asking you for your uh, email address and ways to follow up. Anybody get it yet? Anybody get through? It's 69866. <laughs> All right, well, that should give you a general sense of how quick and easy this stuff is. Um, and it's also incredibly important to a lot of the organizing that's going on in immigra immigration reform and all sorts of movements that are happening in the U.S. right now and abroad. Um, so first we're going to have Rachel Labruyere speak about her work, um, past and present, and then we'll just go down the line. So, Rachel. <laughs> it's not on. Can you hear it? Is is it on? Because okay, okay. Um, with the Reform of Immigration for America campaign, one of the things that I was uh, asked to talk about today was the work that we did to build a very very large mobile list um, with the goal of passing comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level. As most of you know, that didn't actually happen, um, but we did build a very big mobile list and built a lot of power within the movement um, for a lot of people who really hadn't had a seat at the table before. So um, just to kind of orient the conversation, I want to talk a little bit about why we built the list. Um, in 2007, the last time that immigration reform was actually um, considered at the federal level, we were outcalled and outfaxed by our opposition, by the people that don't want to pass immigration reform almost 20 to 1 um, from the reports that we got on the Hill from reps and senators' offices. So we knew that even though our ground game was great, we had millions of people marching in the streets in 2006, that, though, that direct action wasn't actually translating into calls and, and touches into uh, elected officials. So we decided we really need to up our capacity in this area. How do we do it? Um, you know, the first thing that everybody thinks of is, oh, let's build an email list. We can drive in tons of faxes. It'll be great. But one of the things we realized was that our base wasn't in those traditional online spaces. Um, we, a lot of our base are communities of color, low-income communities, a lot of undocumented people um, that don't have consistent access to the Internet. So we chose to go with mobile. 
um, which in the end turned out to be the right choice um, because we were really meeting the communities who wanted that access where they were at and where they were at was on their cell phone. Um, so, you know, a part of the reason we chose mobile was that Latino usage of mobile and specifically text messaging far outstripped any other technology that la the Latino population was using at the time. Um, it, interestingly enough, throughout the campaign, throughout the mobile list, our Spanish list grew uh, at a rate of almost two to one larger than our English list. Um, and so you know the list was fully bilingual. Um, so you know, we were, like I said, it, it was all about meeting our base where they were at. Um, so just to give you a little sense of how we built the list, what, is this, what does it actually take? What does it look like in terms of getting a list like this off of the ground? Um, well, we started internally getting staff, making sure that we had people that were bought in, right? Um, this was new technology. We had to convince people that it was going to be worth the time and investment um, it was going to take. Uh, we, we were a national coalition. So we started talking with our partners across the country that were on the ground that we were going to rely on to help us build this list. And we said, you know, if you help build the list in your community, not only do you get to use it, you get access to it for your local organizing, but we're going to be using it at the national level too. So we wanted to make sure that it was really mutually beneficial to the actual organizing that was happening on the ground at the moment. Um, integration is key when you're using mobile. It's not a standalone silver bullet. It's not something that you can tack on at the end of a campaign. It's something you have to have in your mind as you're building out your campaign plan, both online and offline. Um, and we chose Mobile Commons uh, as our platform because it gave us a lot of flexibility. Um, it gave us the ability to, to change up things in real time, really, really pay attention to our metrics and our numbers, our reporting, seeing what worked and what didn't work. Um, and clearly, I think we made the right decision because now I'm working for them. Um, but you know, one of, the, one of the things that people are like, well, what do, you, what do you give people when they sign up for a mobile list? Like, you guys just signed up for the iWord campaign. You got the, you got the message back. It asked for your name and your email address. How many people actually gave them your name and your email address? All right, great. Um, if you had signed up for our text list with the campaign, we actually would have asked for your zip code and your email address. And that's because at the end of the day, our goal was to connect people to their elected official. So in order to target them correctly, we needed their, their zip code to get their, their congressional district, where they were living, who their senator was. Um, so we were like, what, what, are we gonna, what are we gonna give people when they text in? We decided it was gonna be three things, actions that they could take, whether or not that was calling a senator or you know, texting in to, to sign a pledge, um, alerts, breaking news. Um, we wanted them to know when legislation was happening the minute it happened, and feedback. What, what went down after you made your call? How many calls were made? Closing that loop for people was really, really important on the list. Um, so then actually building the list, which is what I think a lot of people are really interested in when you talk about mobile. It's like, how do you get there? Um, we threw everything in the kitchen sink at this thing. Uh, we did ad buy, I, I bought billboards in West Palm Beach to test out. Uh, we did in-person events. Every time we had an in-person event, somebody was on stage saying, take out your phone, text justice to 69866, much the way Jamila just did, but doing it at least three times from the stage. Apparently that's the magic number, that's the sticking point. Um, we did Facebook ads, we did Google ads, uh, we promoted it on email, but one of the things, uh, well, a few of the things that we learned were that Recruiting people for a mobile list on email is not a silver bullet. We thought, oh, great, we already have a, a, a fairly decently sized email list. This is going to get a lot of jump on our mobile list. It wasn't true. Um, in fact, a lot of the people that were there, there wasn't all that much overlap on our mobile and our email list at the end of the day when I left the campaign. Um, so how did we build it? A lot of it was this in-person event idea. Um, when we have 2,000 people at a rally who are fired up about a specific issue, it's such a missed opportunity if you don't ask them to engage with you on that tool right there. And what really sets it apart from email is you don't have to go around and walk around and ask people to sign up on a clipboard and then not be able to read handwriting or be getting people's you know, fake phone numbers. They're actually, they're, they're taking the initiative, signing up themselves, and you're getting their information right there. Um, the other thing that we found out was pass along, tell a friend. Every, every single thing that we did on the list, whether or not that was pick up your phone and call your Congress member, or you know, just text in this word to join, as soon as you got that reply back, we asked you to forward it to friends. Um, and that was a huge list builder for us. 
Uh, the other thing we did was, you know, meeting, like I said, meeting our base where they were at. We had people go on Spanish language radio. Um, you know, some of our organizers in certain communities, for example, LA, had really good um, relationships with El Piolin, who has the biggest Spanish language radio um, show in the nation. And, you know, just saying text justice to 69866 once on air, we saw a huge spike in our list growth. So it's not about how much money you spend on advertising, and it's not about making sure that you're putting it on your website and on your email, even though that's true and you need to do those things. It's about figuring out where your audience is and making sure you're giving them a good reason to opt into the list. Um, so the, the one other thing that I would say is that um, a lot of people will come to me and be like, my list just isn't growing. I don't know what to do. I'm like, well, do you guys, you know, do you pass out hand cards? Do you have flyers? Yes, yes, yes. Is your, is your opt-in on there? No. Okay. Your opt-in. So is your text this keyword to your short code on there? And, and most people will say no. Just making sure that every single thing that comes out of your shop has that on it. And, and, and your website, too, if, that, if you want people to go to your website. But you're actually asking people to directly engage with you when you're asking them to text in, as opposed to visit the website, glean the information that you want, and then maybe follow up with us or join our email list. Um, so how much... Am I over time? Okay. So to give you a little bit of a sense of what we actually did with the list that I keep talking about and saying was so great, um, one, of the thing, one of our main goals, like I said before, was driving in phone calls. So for example, um, in September of last year, there was the first push around the DREAM Act. How many people here are familiar with what the DREAM Act is? Okay, good. That's good. good number. Normally see much lower. Um, so the, the first push around the DREAM Act, which was federal legislation that would give students and youth a pathway to citizen, earned citizenship um, for, you know, while they attended college, joined the military, et cetera, um, really one of the best parts of comprehensive immigration reform that we could have asked for to, to be moving. Um, so, you know, when that happened, we would send you a text message if you were on our list, and we would say, this is happening, the vote's tomorrow, we need you to call your senator. You would get that text message, and if you just reply call, your cell phone would call you. You would automatically be connected. You would hear a script, normally it was my voice, saying, when you're connected, tell your senator, vote yes on the DREAM Act. And we would be routing you to your correct senator. And the great thing about this technology is not only could I route you to your senator in your state, but if there was one senator that we knew didn't need to hear from you, either because they were already a yes vote or because they were not capable of being convinced, all of your calls were going to that other senator that we knew need, that we knew we still had leverage on. Um, so calling campaigns, we did a lot of calling campaigns. During a 24-hour period in December um, for the DREAM Act, we drove in over 70,000 calls in 24 hours. Um, and that's really the power of this sort of technology. So that's just a sense of the things that we did with the list. Um, I'm going to wrap it up because I was just told to. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess the bottom line here and the way that this ties into the rest of what people will be speaking about is that here we were giving people, a lot of them undocumented, a lot of them not native English speakers, a seat at the table to actually directly connect with elected officials that were considering legislation that would affect their lives. Um, so it was something, you know, we, people were thrilled to join this list in the beginning because it was the first time that they had ever really had any sort of participation in, you know, the legislative process. Um, I think I think I'm wrapped up. Okay. Which number? The 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 one for the campaign. So if you text justice to six nine eight six six, six just six nine eight six six. It's the same number that you texted the I word campaign into, but text in the word justice, and that will that will get you on that list. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, no, it was, uh, when I left, it was about 180, 185,000. It's a big list. It's it did big list. great work. Yeah. Um, so next we're going to have Jed talk about the platform, Mobile Commons as a platform, and, and how folks can get the most out of that. Sure. So, uh, first of all, there's just two things about what Reform Immigration for America did that I think are extraordinary. One is they produced an enormous report that details everything in great detail that they did, what the response rates were, what worked, where it's not appropriate, what you shouldn't do, what didn't work, and then the things that work very well. And I think you can get, where can you get it? It's just smsadvocacy.org. And uh, 
The second thing is, and it's just a pervasive theme, which is they put mobile into the hands of organizers rather than using it for the sake of using technology. So they had a, it was a very objective oriented. It really was about outcome, not building a mobile list, but uh, uh, building a, a route to an outcome that is really, I think, a, uh, a great example of just how to use technology in general. So um, mobile commons is a uh, platform that businesses and organizations uh, license in order to enable mobile communications in a kind of a data and um, CRM specific way, meaning accessing a database, messaging the right people with the right message, that's a, that enables uh, Reform Immigration for America or lots of other organizations. And then it ties back into whatever other larger database or CRM system you're using, whether it's Convio or Salesforce or Salsa or whatever it is, to bring it back in so you're not creating some new silo of, uh, uh, of, of data. Um, and w w what our platform does, and you can sort of see from the one you got back, is it ties together uh, mobile web, voice, and you know most because it's the most pervasive form of technology in the United States. I mean, of communication in the United States, text messaging into something that can work together or independently, all from one kind of dashboard, and then ties it back to the CRM system. But I thought. Uh, if it, actually, I thought maybe we go through sort of how mobile basically works and what some of the issues are with it. And if you leave that first slide up, because um, I, I think that might sort of, thanks. So, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is mobile at a kind of scale beyond sending out a couple of hundred text messages to a few supporters, because for that, you don't really need to license any kind of platform, but you could easily do it on your own and manage it on your own. But the way the carriers have enabled sort of the enterprise level or the scaled level of, um, of doing mobile is they require that it be done through a short code, like 69866. So 69866 is sort of the 800 number of the mobile universe in the United States. So this is, in this case, like 698, I mean the short code. So this is an example of a short code 3064. Um, uh, and those are quite expensive. As you can see, the way the, the expense is defrayed for lots of organizations is there, we use shared short codes in cases where there's a, a, a cost issue and the keyword governs it. So I'm just going to go through what that process is. The, the process of getting a short code requires initially a securing of a short code from something called US short code, which is sort of the monopolistic GoDaddy, and paying a minimum of $3,000 for three months of, of, of uh, uh, service for a short code, and then aggregating it, meaning getting the approval from all the carriers through an intermediary to have the right to do what you're asking to do on it. The, uh, the issues I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later are there's just a tremendous. have notes. The the issue is that there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty associated with what the rules are, and what and the carriers will will and will not allow to happen. And to, I just want to put it in the context of how big mobile is. Mobile mobile comes as close to reaching everybody, particularly SMS, as any other form of electronic communication in the United States. Almost all phones receive text messages, more than. 85% of people use text messages regularly, which is defined as like once a month. Um, there's about 8 billion cent a day in the United States now, far outstripping every other form of, of electronic communication. Um, and people really view them because it's still relatively spam free. Um, and probably, in fact, most of the spam that you get that feels like a spam text message is really a marketing message from your carrier, which unbeknownst to you, you've probably pre-agreed to. Um, <coughs> I will try. Like what a, which one? Like View? A little, a little. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Slideshow. Slideshow, OK. Well, um, <laughs> as you can see, mobile is getting bigger all the time. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it just gets, because it's mobile and because it's extremely conversational, because people send so many text messages, you get really high response rates. So if you have a sign or a radio ad or a call to action, 
and uh, you 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 put you you put up a URL or you put up a phone number or you put up anything else, a mobile call to action is just going to yield a much higher result. And it's just like over and over and over again. So it's it's incredibly efficient. Um, uh, uh, and what's significant to many of our customers is that it really reaches people not well served by not at all served by the internet, almost completely. We've sort of uh, sometimes say it. It, it, it has a, it's a rope bridge over the digital divide because it's wholly insufficient, but at least it is, in many cases, uh, for a large segment of the population, their, their, their really only way into an, uh, a, a digital universe. In fact, um, we're doing some healthcare work and I heard the following statistic, which is that 48% of people with chronic illness have no internet access. 48% of people with chronic illness have no internet access. The meeting was, of course, about like how to create iPhone apps for people with chronic illness. <laughs> and, the, uh, and, you know, because, it, you know, it's, it's not exactly what, uh, what people think about, but that's, so there are enormous segments of the population that don't really have a reliable way to be reached. And I think while mobile is very good at being integrated with other media, it's also very good at reaching people that other media don't reach. And I think that also that was one of the great lessons of reform immigration for America. Um, uh, also, I mean, that's probably an old number, but a huge number of households no longer have landlines. And that's not a, a trend that's likely to change any time in the future. So, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, that's happening a lot. That's like a year and a half old uh, uh, statistic. So you ha what you have is a universe of tremendous reach and activity across various demographics. We always, in sort of marketing, we always say, oh, mobile is the best way to, it's the only way I know of, in fact, that is the best way to reach a rich person and a poor person. I mean, the, the, it, it, it is, and it is, it is the form of communication that people have said, this is how I choose to communicate. And yet around it, there's an unbelievable amount of uncertainty. We don't know what's approved. We don't know what's regulated. We don't know uh, uh, whether they can be dropped all the time. And without going to specific examples, these aren't hypothetical problems. <coughs> there are uh, numerous occasions where large campaigns or, or, or groups have said, I can't take the, the, the risk of launching a huge campaign around mobile because I don't know if it's going to be shut down at any time. And there are cases of where campaigns have been shut down. So th that chilling effect is real, and there really does need to be some kind of rules of the road, clarity, and openness so that people who have opted in to receive information, whether it's about immigration reform or health care, can regularly know that the people, that it will get through, that it won't be blocked, that it won't be subject to like the whim of a particular carrier in stopping particular information to go through. And again, you know, there's numerous examples of this that would be the subject of a whole other panel, but the, uh, I mean, that, that's, that is a, a completely, um, oh, okay, wrap up already? Okay, so I'm just gonna show you very quickly how other people are, uh, 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 are, are, are using mobile. Um, that really goes to its extensive reach. So what, one of the things I just want to bring up, because it, it didn't, it wouldn't get uh, uh, brought in here, is how journalism, and particularly public radio, is using mobile. In this case, very clever way to reach out to people and collect data on whose streets weren't plowed during the blizzard in New York City, and then sort of accumulating lists of people that can then be used as sources. Each one of those people texted in and then left a voice message about what was going on in their street immediately to contradict um, the mayor's statement that all streets were plowed which annoyed him a lot. Um, they, they did that in Chicago as well. Here, uh, uh, WDET and I think Public Radio International uh, did it armed young people throughout a uh, Mexican town in Detroit with the ability to text in license plates of trucks that were driving through the streets and making them sort of uh, investigative journalists in a way that no one had ever sought to enforce this really terrible blight on Mexican town of these trucks going through by schools and by homes and you know, generating asthma conditions. And it, it, it created an effect and it also extended the reach of public media to, to bring in new people into public media but also to create a whole new universe of sources that they could reach out to. They don't have to go. It's been very good for fundraising like with him. 
And uh, this is just another, just to, the, the last one I'll show is, you know, the, 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 this is, it is very important. This is an example of where Planned Parenthood is using live chat to connect people who have Planned Parenthood related questions with healthcare professionals on the medium that they have. There'd be very little so that, that you can turn uh, a text chat into live chat and, you know, answer your health related questions. You know, I would describe that as like a vital service for people to get information about uh, 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 health care that, again, you know, has, is associated with tremendous uncertainty. because I no longer have control over it. Okay, great. Now you can see the cities I hang out in. <laughs> All right. View. View. Where are we going? There we go. Thanks. Start from the beginning. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the way that mobile is being used in the developing world. It's, it's slightly different than the way that I think that most of the people on the panel here are approaching mobile today, but it is sort of interesting because it does provide us with some really great examples of the way that people are overcoming the digital divide in very organic ways. Um, and it also shows us the rate of innovation and the types of innovation that are coming from parts outside of the United States. And so here be dragons. Uh, there's been unbelievable growth in terms of the way that mobile has uh, just skyrocketed mobile use and mobile ownership in the developing world. In 2009, 90% of people actually had served access to a signal, so uh, universal coverage. 2010, 5 billion people had a mobile phone or a mobile phone subscription. By 2013, we're expecting it to be uh, 6.3 billion, and by 2020, we're expecting universal access. So that means every single person on the planet who wants access to a mobile phone can have one. Probably not children, um, necessarily advise that, but certainly adults and uh, anybody who's in sort of the process of uh, being a member of sort of the economic or political society that we're all a part of. Most of that growth has come in, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's a good reason for that. If you look at this image, anywhere that you see orange is actually population, right? And so those are the clusters of population density on the continent. Anywhere that you see purple is where you actually have access to electricity infrastructure. You'll see that it doesn't really map very well to population. Now, of course, everyone has generators. They have car batteries. They do find ways to actually get access to, to things like simple electricity. But this is sort of your constant infrastructure for electrical access on the continent of, uh, of Africa. But that's where you have mobile coverage. Now, this is from 2009, so things have changed significantly even since then. But this tends to be sort of where we have the latest data from. And in fact, I'm sure that a lot of you can challenge me on those data statistics that I've thrown out earlier. Um, unfortunately, it is a really hard thing to get sort of really good, solid data, and a lot of people do disagree. But I tended to go with a more conservative one, so you can imagine that actual growth and penetration and what we would call access to a mobile, so in terms of somebody in the household who actually might have a mobile and that the community might have access to, is really quite high. So some of the key drivers of adoption in this space, uh, a lot of the same drivers that drove adoption in the United States just a few years uh, down the line. So decreased handset costs and billing structure, increased access to network infrastructure, and in, um, in particularly in rural areas, prepaid services. So not a lot of people that in the United States are necessarily, and I would imagine in this room, familiar with what prepaid does. Prepaid is, uh, you may be familiar with the idea and concept, raise hands, everyone's seen it? Okay, great. All right. So just this idea that you can actually go into a little corner store and when you need the when you need access to services or, or airtime, that's something that you're in control of as opposed to your provider being the one who drives that and drives that cost structure. Market liberalization and increased competition, the move away from state funded telecos, um, and targeted policy and regulation. Increasingly a lot of countries in the developing world, and it is a massive generalization for me to say this, um, are aware of the importance of um, of mobile in terms of driving sort of economic growth and uh, um, service delivery. 
So some of the ways that mobile can be used, particularly in the political space, um, I work for the National Democratic Institute, as was mentioned earlier. We do democracy support and development in 70 countries overseas. And we're really, really excited about these particular sort of aspects and, and things that we've seen on the ground. What we try to do generally is actually reinforce the way that people are using mobile and make it easier, faster, and more efficient, rather than try to impose frameworks. Um, yes, please. No, no, this is all this is all cell phones. Yeah, absolutely. Satellite phones are tend to be very expensive. Um, and uh, particularly in closed societies, they're actually very often illegal. So the um, the amount of access that your average individual has to satellite phones is very low. So they just build themselves all the time. Uh, they're building network towers absolutely everywhere. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that in, um, in terms of incentive. Number one is just access to new markets, opening up those markets. Uh, but then there has been a lot in terms of policy around uh, targeting it so that universal access is actually a um, policy directive, so when, when new mobile operators come into countries, that they have to uh, reach rural access areas as well as um, blanket the urban environment. So these are some of the things we're really excited about. Election monitoring, that is actually the use of structured texts and SMS. What Certainly you can use voice, but structured text and SMS by election observers in polling places that count uh, everything from the number of votes recorded to the way that the election was conducted, whether there was party intimidation in polling places, whether people were, who were actually on the voter rolls were allowed to vote, and put that all into sort of a structured text message and send that in uh, to a central communications server or database that then spits back a record that says, thank you very much, all of your numbers look correct, or maybe you got that wrong, would you mind coming back to us on that? And actually triages the process of election observation and reporting, so when those numbers and when those polls close, um, sort of these domestic election groups are able to estimate what, how the, well, excuse me, uh, the results of the election, but also the conduct of how it happened. And this has been tremendously important. There have been some great examples of it being used in Kenya and Ghana. Um, it was actually initially pioneered in the Ukraine. But then sort of most significantly, this process was used in Zimbabwe to question the um, election results in the last election cycle, which led to the power sharing government that exists there today. Um, so it's a tremendously powerful tool. Along with that, a citizen reporting. I don't know if anyone here has heard of the platform Ushahidi. Anybody? Raise your hand. Yeah. Cool. All right. So citizen reporting is sort of the qualitative layer on top of quantitative election reporting that you would see in, in the election monitoring space. And it really gives a new avenue for citizens to actually engage, send, use their mobile phones to report on things that they see, um, whether it be, it be good or bad, uh, that uh, they observe about the election process. Ushahidi? Um, Ushahidi, it's a Swahili word that means witness. Uh, if, I, I'm happy if you want after the panel to, to give that to you. Uh, participatory budgeting, this was a technique that was pioneered in Argentina and Brazil. It's, uh, the, it's when a municipal government actually allocates a certain portion of their budget to uh, the, to citizen, sort of, the citizen participation. So citizens get to prioritize what they want to spend their budget on. Very often it's related to things like health care and education. Um, but the way that mobiles are used is there's a sensitization campaign around what the process is going to look like. And mobiles have actually increased the amount of participation in participatory budgeting uh, dramatically, particularly among some of these lower income community groups, which I think were referenced earlier on the panel. So particularly among marginalized groups, mobile has just been tremendous inroads in that space. Um, representative accountability. That's the idea of keeping your locally elected representative accountable for what they do. I think we're all really excited about that. Um, in locations and countries where people don't have access to the web and they may, there may not be sort of a universal free press or, in, in fact, um, newspapers might be too expensive for people to purchase high degrees of, a, of sort of functional illiteracy, representative accountability is the idea that you can actually reach out directly to your representative uh, and whatever their staff and office um, sort of resources are. Resource allocation and outcome, that's this idea that uh, when you vote for individuals and they actually allocate those resources, you can see where that cost is going. One of my favorite examples is in Haiti. Um, a group in the north of Haiti was looking at trying to develop the tourism industry there, and they found out that all this money that they'd put in for, for roads for the development of uh, better facilities to get people in and out of the, of the beach hadn't been used for that purpose, and people were able to actually document that by taking pictures and sending that in on the network. Um, and then violence monitoring. This is particularly common in um, countries in post-conflict and then also sort of these hot zones. One of my favorite examples, again, is actually in Juarez. State Department has been working with a, a local Mexican group um, in, in the city of Juarez to ha give people anonymous ways to report on sort of incidents of violence and intimidation. Um, also, radio and citizen media. We are at a media conference. Uh, citizen participation um, in, in environments where infrastructure is very low and people don't necessarily have access to, to uh, television. Radio is just 
ninety percent of the world has access to a radio. Um, and so something that's become increasingly popular is the incorporation of mobile phones and radio communications. Um, that could be sort of targeted shows that have call-ins and questions, and you get your local sort of citizen. Um, your civil society groups there, you get your elected representatives, or you get your candidates for office, and voters are actually able to call and ask questions, or you can get people from the national, or from the election commissions answering questions about where do you go vote, what is it that you actually need, um, and as well as going out into the street and asking questions of, of people in the community and then answering those questions and, and, and bringing them back and, and um, facilitating a cycle of question and response that makes overall your local community more accountable and responds more directly to the interests of what, what that community is. And then, as I said, seriously awesome free tools have actually facilitated this. One of the things, I mentioned Dushahidi, that is a free and open source platform that is available. Uh, Freedom Phone was something that was developed, oh, and I should also mention all of these um, have really come out of sort of the global south. Ushahidi came out of Kenya. Freedom Phone came out of, it's an uh, interactive voice response system, our IVR, uh, and it came out of Zimbabwe, and it's this idea that you can actually put sort of short radio segments on a mobile phone so people can call in and, and, and um, listen and select the information that they're looking for and also leave messages that, inf that inform sort of the direction of future programming. And then Frontline SMS, which is another free product that has been developed to capture SMS and um, SMS messages as well as send SMS messages out. So it becomes a really great sort of uh, almost like an email list tool if, if we were thinking of it that way. And got to wrap up. Uh, so major security challenges, I, you know, I think that um, particularly in sort of the light of what's happened in Tunisia and Egypt lately, um, and certainly in other countries around the world, they, mobiles have been sort of held up as a great organizing tool. And that is true, but they're totally insecure and transparent. They are basically a postcard of whatever you send. There was a recent case that made uh, headlines in the New York Times lately of this German MP who went to um, uh, T Tcom, uh, T-Mobile, which is the major German telco, um, and found all of his data around all of his movements, everything that he'd done over the course of the past six months, and, re and requisitioned that and got access to it. Um, that's true everywhere in the world. Lawful Intercept uh, allows governments to look into pretty much everything that, that you do on your mobile phone. So postcard of data, location disclosure, and, and obviously the disclosure and exposure of all of your networks that you're communicating with. Manipulation and chilling effects. In the last elections in Uganda, the government actually censored any messages that had words like dictator or Mubarak, um, telling you what their concerns were, um, as well as being able to just maintain records. We've heard reports from activists in Iran and Egypt that um, that not only were they detained, but, but actual records of their SMSs were shared with them once they were in detention. Uh, common practice risks, the digital divide, women, rural areas, and minorities are often left out of the equation. Anybody who is mobily illiterate, um, we can, that's just this idea that you might be functional on your mobile but might not actually know how it works. Overuse and research exhaustion, that's the same challenges that we faced here. Uh, cost, bandwidth, and spam. People don't like being spammed on their mobiles. It's a personal device. Uh, future opportunity and trends, the growth of data everywhere. Um, zero rating, that's basically free data. Facebook's pioneering in that. Simple SIM innovation. Geolocation for improved service delivery. Um, and mobile as a device, not a network. That's this idea that it's not necessarily about the communications on the network, but it's also about what your mobile can do when it's in your pocket and offline. And I'm just going to conclude with, oh, yeah, and my favorite picture. Normally when I go out and give these presentations, I show a picture of somebody in sub-Saharan Africa holding a mobile phone, which is a bit of a cliche, and I try. And it's not my favorite thing to do, but I'm so excited to be able to show you a picture from the Egyptian Revolution of a woman on her mobile phone expressing her joy right after Mubarak stepped down. So thank you. Hi. So I'm, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what, what other folks have done, maybe a little bit more like what Catherine just did, but talk more abstractly or uh, more um, theoretically about what it is that we're all doing here and the, the notion of a mobile phone as being a political device and mobile networks being political networks. So slightly ridiculous title. So what do we mean when I say that, when I say that a mobile phone is political, when we all talk about the politics of mobile phones? For me, and I think for a lot of people, we, we're talking about mobile phones being essential tools for engaging in politics, news gathering, and community organizing. We've touched on all of those things here. And we've also touched on the fact that mobile use is exploding, and um, the way that we use the web, even though a lot of us don't have access to the web, is changing. And more of us are getting access to the web all the time, thanks in part to mobile phones. Um, nearly half of all U.S. adults access news on their phones. This st stat just came out recently. I think the actual number is something like 47%. That means they use their phones to get weather updates, to get sports updates, to get news headlines. Um, that's pretty revolutionary. 
uh, Latinos, Asian Americans, and African Americans use uh, the mobile web even more than other groups do. And by 2014, more Americans will access the web on their mobile devices than they will on their computers. Um, and I, when I say mobile devices, that of course means tablets and whatever else Apple cooks up um, in between now and then. Uh, but of course, there are obstacles to access, and um, mainly the idea being that if something is politically empowering, then someone is going to want to control it, and I don't mean uh, necessarily just the, the people who are using it. Um, and in this case, I'm talking about mobile carriers domestically. Um, a few ways that they try to exert control over these platforms and these devices is, is via pricing. Uh, limited competition. Uh, means higher prices. So for example, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, AT&T's proposed merger of T-Mobile would create fewer companies uh, in the mobile space. That would mean there would be less incentive for those companies to push down prices. Um, T-Mobile actually offered lower prices, I think something like 20% uh, lower prices than other carriers. Um, that's going to go away, and there will be fewer carriers who can provide a cheaper option, especially for people who can't afford these higher and higher prices that we're seeing. Um, carrier control also means that devices, uh, that we lose choice in our devices, uh, we lose availability and we lose openness. And what I mean by that is, for example, uh, there is a, a, a activity called uh, a carrier, uh, sorry, device exclusivity, which means that, for example, when the iPhone comes out, one carrier will own it for one, two, or three years, as we saw. Um, to the detriment of all the other carriers and to the detriment of those of us who don't have, for example, uh, AT&T or don't want AT&T. This is a problem uh, when technology moves so quickly and innovation moves so quickly in this space and certain behaviors start uh, forming around devices like the iPhone, but we don't all have access to it. Um, that doesn't need to be that way, and we can talk about that a little bit later, um, but it is that way largely because there is limited competition in this space. Um, data caps, we are accessing a ton of data on our phones. We are going to continue to do that in, in greater numbers. Um, and the, the carrier's response is, rather than saying, all right, well, why don't we create more robust networks, they're, gonna, they're saying, we're going to make you use less data, um, which they know is, is going to increase their, their uh, uh, profits because we are all using more and more data. So if we go over certain caps, for example, if we start watching streaming Netflix more and more on our phones. Who streams Netflix on their iPhone? You better do it over Wi-Fi, because if you do it over 3G, you're going to get hit with caps really, really quickly. And I think at first, when they introduced that, you uh, couldn't stream Netflix over your uh, data connection. Uh, now you can. And so be careful. <laughs> um, and then finally, access. Uh, we can have the greatest and latest devices, but if we don't have high-speed broadband mobile networks in our areas, then they're, they're basically useless unless we're standing in our living rooms if we have uh, regular internet there. Price matters. Uh, political engagement depends on access to new technologies and new networks. Um, for example, phones are expensive, but we don't really know the true cost. So for example, if, if you break your iPhone or throw it in the toilet and it's dead, um, or Android, I shouldn't keep saying iPhone, you can often have to pay up to $600, $700 to replace that device. Um, that is what the carrier tells you is the true cost of the device. They subsidize it um, through a two-year contract, but they will never tell you what the actual cost of that device is. And if I pay $200 for a device in exchange for a two-year contract, why, when that contract is over, am I paying the same cost month to month? Shouldn't it go down? Um, text messaging costs, as you guys know, I'm sure, costs carriers almost nothing. It, it, it actually exists on... on um, spectrum that was, was discovered after uh, mobile phones uh, became prominent. And in, in a sense, it's almost pure profit for the carriers, yet we pay 10, 20 cents per uh, text message. All right, I'll take three deep breaths. <laughs> it's important, you know? Oh, I got to start all over again. Okay. <laughs> That's good. How often does that pop up? Twice a day. All right. Mine just say tweet. <laughs> um, uh, where are we? Text messaging. Less competition. So like I said, less competition means higher prices. And then tiered pricing structures. These are a lot of like crazy words I'm throwing around. I will describe this in more detail. But uh, basically, when you have tiered pricing structures that say, oh, for, for 
forty dollars a month, you have access to this stuff online. For fifty bucks a month, you have access to this stuff online. For sixty, you have all these wild offerings via our partners. Um, there are problems there. Uh, there are problems for people who can't afford the sixty buck a month plan, only forty dollars a month, but then they don't have access to certain content that on on the desktop on their desktops and laptops they have access to. That's not the same internet that that we should all be getting. Um, that's a threat to net neutrality. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And finally, openness matters. Um, closed phones and platforms block innovation and discourage participation. So talking very abstractly about this, open platforms, whatever those are, allow social, political, and technological innovation. Closed platforms, whatever those are, and I'm, again, we'll get to that, uh, create walled gardens, too much control, and opportunities for censorship and corporate control. Do you, who knows what I'm talking about when I say open platforms? and closed platforms. OK, good. Um, so in reality, when we talk about open platforms, we're often talking about open source platforms. Android is quote unquote open source. Um, the iPhone uh, OS, iOS is quote unquote not, is, is a closed platform. But the reality is that all these platforms are a mix of open and closed in, in practice and in engineering. And um, it's, it's pretty risky when you start drawing absolutes. Data matters. The more we use data, the bigger the fight to cap it. So growing bandwidth consumption on wireline and wireless, like I said, and this translates also to the way that we watch video online, uh, who streams Netflix on their laptops or their desktops or on Roku or other devices. Um, the, the, the cable companies are very unhappy that you're doing that. <laughs> uh, and they claim they're unhappy because you're clogging their pipes, but really they want to offer you their own video and they don't like Netflix uh, riding on their pipes. We pay Netflix eight bucks a month. We stop paying Comcast, however many dollars we pay them a month. Um, this also exists on, on wireless devices as well, and so they're going to try to cap that in all kinds of creative ways. Um, but the fact is that uploading and viewing videos empower us, as we've seen in Egypt and elsewhere, and not just videos, but all, all kinds of usages of, of uh, data on, on our wireless devices. And to cap that means to cap that empowerment. Um, new applications that we don't even know about yet will rely on fast and unlimited data connections. To, to cap this, these data connections now for the reasons that the carriers are telling us they want to um, is, is going to limit our ability to, to innovate and to use these new innovations. And finally, expensive data caps stop us from using these new tools, like I just said, redundancy. Access matters. Without access to high-speed networks, we can't connect and participate. Um, the big carriers find, it, find very little incentive to build high-speed networks in underserved areas because it's not profitable for them. Um, this is a problem because when municipal networks try to get in there and say, all right, well, we'll, we'll build these networks ourselves, the uh, companies like Verizon, T-Mobile, or not T-Mobile, uh, AT&T, same thing, um, will get in there and they'll actually try to introduce legislation to stop mu municipalities from doing that. Um, the, the end result is that we all get kind of screwed in that process. Um, the problem is that without high-speed wireless, we're going to get left behind. As I said, by 2014, most of us will access the web on our phones rather than on our desktops or laptops. Um, if we don't have access to these networks, we're going to be in really bad trouble. We won't be able to participate in society uh, like we want to. Um, and, and communities themselves will not be able to advocate for their needs because um, organizing, as we've seen as well, takes place over mobile networks. If we don't have access to these mobile networks, we don't have access to tools for organization and political engagement. So I'm going to bring this a little bit back to, to more concrete things. Um, talk about three bad things. First bad thing is uh, two minutes. AT&T and T-Mobile's possible uh, merger. Uh, the second is Metro PS PCS's bad data plans. And the third is FCC's net bad net neutrality rule. First bad, really quick. AT&T wants to buy T-Mobile. That would create a virtual duopoly that would be almost 80% of the market. Um, it would result in higher prices, less innovation, and fewer jobs. Trust me on that. Um, and it would limit your ability to use the phone. Your phone as a political tool. Second, Metro P does anybody have Metro PCS? For those of you who don't know, it's the fifth largest carrier, will be the fourth if the deal goes through. Um, they largely deal with these prepaid plans that we talked about. They also serve a lot of underserved areas, especially in urban communities, and uh, they're affordable. And they've been a, a lifesaver for a lot of people who can't afford 
more expensive plans or, or who can't get a, uh, a contract with a regular carrier. Um, but they've introduced these new 4G plans that are, are pretty bad news. One, uh, they block the cheapest plans for 40 bucks a month, block video and voice applications in many websites, advanced HTML websites, whatever they decide that means. Um, so if I, if I can only afford 40 bucks a month for that plan, I can't access, for example, Skype on my phone. And I can't access an advanced HTML website. I'm pretty sure Gmail uh, qualifies there. Um, these these uh, violations explicitly break those FCC rules that I mentioned. Um, even though those FCC rules are pretty weak and they barely cover wireless at all, uh, they do cover the blocking of these applications and, and these websites. Um, so that's a problem. And uh, Metro PCS, rather than changing their plans to accommodate what people deserve, they are suing the FCC. <laughs> and um, as I kind of referred to before, all of this disproportionately affects people with less income who depend on these, these cheaper plans. Finally, th that weak net neutrality rule that I, I mentioned provides limited protections for wired broadband and, and, not, and very few at all for wireless. Um, it allows carriers to block or degrade applications and websites as they choose to an extent. And uh, the problem is that with mobile tech becoming preeminent, free speech itself is at risk. So uh, bringing it home, what do we believe when we talk about all this stuff? And I think when, when everybody here is talking about the work that they do that's so important, I think, I think we can agree with this, and I, I think we can all have a discussion about this. We think that mobile devices and networks are essential tools for political engagement. We think that everyone needs access to those tools, and we need to ensure that everyone can use them uh, without unnecessary restrictions. So what are some next big questions and uh, steps for us to take and ask? Uh, one is the role of app stores and software hardware providers as gatekeepers, and how do we reconcile those roles? We'll be discussing that at 11 <laughs> uh, at this conference. Uh, open and closed versus closed, Android versus iPhone, and how to protect um, against market abuse when, for example, uh, Apple's App Store has so many customers and it can willy-nilly decide what to allow into that or not to allow into that store. How can we hold big corporations and carriers accountable, and how can we empower the FCC and Congress to protect us from carrier control of devices and networks? Thanks. All right, so I think we're going to jump right into questions. I think you had a question real quick. goes to, how does that work? Sure, so you mean citizen reporting in the election context, is that correct? In any context, citizen okay. reporting, how does that get back out to the public? Uh, so I, I mentioned, is, am I on? Okay, great. Um, so I mentioned both radio, the use of radio, and sort of citizen reporting in an election context. Um, citizen radio is one thing where people actually go out, you can go out into the street and you can do sort of these, what I refer to as Vox Pop segments, where you actually capture the voices of individuals. You can use recorders on your mobile, you can use specialized devices to do that, and then you can bring it back to a recording studio and actually broadcast that out. That's a pretty straightforward form of sort of citizen journalism. Um, but citizen reporting in terms of the election contest and increasingly around other issues like service delivery, so um, rubbish pickup, uh, the access to health care, clinics, things like that, uh, what we would sort of term the area where governments actually need to provide services to their citizens, is this idea that you can actually take a mobile phone and send a message or an image or even a video, if you'd like, um, of a report or an incident, and it could be negative or it could be positive, to, to a service or a group or an individual or a campaign that is looking for that sort of information. And it's, it's completely, it's based on the specific use case, but what generally happens is that that's captured in some sort of database and, and then it tends to be published back onto the web. And so some of the criticisms of that is that you do tend to need sort of web access in order to really see the aggregate result of the process, um, which does have a digital divide implication. But there are a lot of people thinking about creative ways to overcome that through sort of subscriptions to reports, um, particularly with the, with the increase in geotagging uh, of r results and reports. That, that's incredibly important because it allows people to subscribe to things that are pertinent to their local community. Um, but 
that that would does that sort of answer your question? Okay, great, fantastic. So it's just that there's some uses in the United States that are going on right now as well, directly related to, in, in many examples, to public media, particularly public radio, where they enable communities to interact as um, sort of citizen reporters and citizen sources in a very regular basis, then those people can be reached out to by reporters and ask questions like, is so-and-so going on in your block? Or the example I gave, you know, the, the mayor says your street has been plowed, is that true? No, it's not true. And then leave it by voice or broadcast on the radio or even accessing other information by voice over here. And there, it's, uh, it's becoming pervasively used um, uh, uh, with public media reporters as a way of extending the, uh, the reach of the journalists. Sort of like a giant Rolodex. Uh, Rachel, your examples off the immigration campaign were great. Are there other best practices, lesson learned sites that you could give us that we could go out and figure out? Or, Jed, you may have some too that you want to refer us to. We aggregate a lot of information from all over just on our site. You know, for the mobile commons, we should yeah, go there. You've got. But it's not, but just uh, other people are using it as well. But, <laughs> but I'm done. <laughs> If you want to record this um, for posterity, you've got to use it. I have no posterity. <laughs> so I could probably talk all day about best practices and lessons learned. And like Jed said, there is a very, it's, it's a very dense report, um, kind of massive actually, on smsadvocacy.com. I believe it's .com. Um, and S smsadvocacy.com. Um, but just to give you a, a couple snippets, um, we tested things as trivial, seemingly trivial, as where do you put the call to action when you send a text message. We found out that for our English list, it worked best in the middle of the text message. For our Spanish list, they liked it at the end. Was there a rhyme or reason? I couldn't tell you, um, but we, we, we tested that out. Um, things like uh, when you are, uh, for example, if you see an 866 number that, will, that we're asking you to call to connect you to your senator, um, Mobile Commons has this great functionality that we call a pingback, which means once you hang up from that call, you get a text message back saying, thank you for calling your senator and asking them to vote yes on the DREAM Act. One of the things we always incorporated into that is if you were a subscriber already on the list, we said, please forward this text message to five friends and ask them to call to. And we included that 866 number in that message to make it as easy as possible on the user to just forward it on. And if you weren't already on the list, we asked you to reply with justice to opt in. So things like that, incorporating Telefriend into almost everything that we did, um, testing out what works in a message and what doesn't. We learned some really interesting things around um, opt out language and how to include it specifically in Spanish. I have a very funny story that would take too long to tell you. If you're interested, I can tell you afterwards. It's all about um, making sure that cultural sensitivity is included in your translation. <laughs> um, and one very panicked day that I had at my desk. Um, but you know, there's there's lots and lots of best practices, and what holds true for for the campaign, for the work that I have done, may not hold true for your specific audience, for your specific issue. But I think that there are some very very basic best practices that really aren't pervasive yet in people using this tool. It's kind of what I'm doing now at Mobile Commons. So if you would like to talk about it, this is what I love to do. Um, so just find me afterwards. Yep. Um, the woman right here in the black. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Cindy Samuels. I'm from CARE2, and I've been listening to all of you, and I have like a universal question for the universal access here. What, over and over, you talk about uh, closed societies. I don't, I'm curious, first of all, is it legal in this country, is it, can you get away with stopping messaging on the basis of ideology? That's the first part. And the second part is for Catherine, is it? Why would all of these closed societies allow universal access regulations in their countries? What's the thinking that allows so much vulnerability to be inserted into their systems? I guess I'll take the latter part of the question first. Um, so when, as I mentioned, I was generalizing quite broadly when I talk about the developing world and closed societies and, and even sort of uh, semi-democratic societies and, and relatively open ones. Um, there, I think that the question, the, the, my favorite formulation is actually the dictator's dilemma, which is this tension between um, access and openness and um, the need to maintain control. And I think that what you're seeing certainly 
currently in, in a lot of the countries in the Middle East is this tension actually erupting um, because people do have access to all this information. And I'm not suggesting that technology drove revolutions in Egypt or Tunisia. I don't believe that is the case. But access to information is extraordinarily powerful, um, and it reframes people's own sort of personal experiences within a broader context. And so the uh, specifically in Tunisia and Egypt, I can, I can speak to the fact that the reason that the government's liberalized the communications infrastructure there is simply because of economic opportunity. Both of the governments wanted to to make more money, um, and there were very powerful commercial interests that recognized the power of telcos to do that. There's huge growth um, in Egypt. I think it's 25% growth over the last two years in the telecoms industry. So there's that's big money in that, um, and very powerful people who wanted access to that slice. Now, and I don't mean to take up too much time, in other countries that, that's not the case, and there's a lot more control, and, and generally an indication of how close the society is is how close the telco operator is to, to the ruling party or the, the ruling individual. Um, and in that case, it, it doesn't, you know, you have access to everything, so. Great. I can address the, uh, is it legal for people to block information? That was away with it, yeah. Can, can, can carriers ever, it, has it happened, I guess? Yeah, they get away with it all the time. Okay. And it's for ideological reasons. Right? Yeah, that's what I said. They if you were doing a Planned Parenthood campaign and the Koch brothers owned the phone company, could they stop it? Yes. Yeah. They could. I, the Koch brothers haven't done it, but <laughs> Verizon did it with their route. I mean, so, oh, right. so, so can they get away with it, and is it legal or two different right, questions? Right, exactly. And <laughs> can they get away with it? Yes, they do. They have done, and, and they will continue to do. Uh, is it legal? It depends on the platform. And actually, legal is not the right word, but are there, are, are there rules against it? Um, SMS is, is covered in a different way than the web, mobile web. The mobile web, as I was saying before, is, is fairly unprotected. So if, a, if a Verizon or AT&T or others wanted to block a certain website, there's nothing really stopping them from doing that, unfortunately, which is one of the main tenets of the current fight for net neutrality. Um, SMS, and I think, Jed, you could probably speak to this, um, is covered uh, under a different regulation. And I think technically it's not uh, allowed for them to block, but they have blocked and they get away with it. I mean, I think the, the issue with SMS is it's not clearly covered by any regulation. It's neither Title I nor Title II uh, or a, an issue with it. The carriers certainly assert that they have the right to uh, to prevent, they wouldn't say that they're blocking it on ideological reasons, and I actually think most of the blocking, although apparently ideological, is really on economic reasons. Um, but the uh, they they certainly have reserved the right to approve or not approve content for any reason that they see fit, which would include ideological reasons. And there have been cases that are that seem ideological um, for content not being approved, and the getting away with it part was customer outrage or bad publicity, but certainly no assertion of a, that a rule or regulation would prevent them from doing this. And in fact, uh, uh, there's a petition that Free Press supports at the FCC asking uh, 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 the FCC to say, no, this is content that's protected and can't be blocked for reasons of content. Great. Other questions? The one in the back. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. Of course. You've got it. Lauren Glenn Davidian, CCTV Burlington, Vermont. Um, can you talk about the civil liberties issues related to law enforcement going to the cell companies and asking for um, location of people who are suspect mm -hmm. and the low bar that um, doesn't require warrants to get access? to this information, and if, have there been challenges to that um, on, sta on state level challenges to it? Because it's happening in local law enforcement, not just the NSA. So is there, um, so what's happening to prevent that from continuing to happen or that the bar for evidence is raised? Josh, do you wanna? I can't speak to that. No? I, I, I can't either. I'm sure. I'm sure there are people at this conference who can speak to that very well, but that's that's not something I have um, any knowledge about. Sorry, Rachel, would you like to make up an answer? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to you on that one. Um, who else? So I think the gentleman here with the glasses. 
which is both of you, <laughs> but <laughs> the black glasses. <laughs> Hi, uh, Glare Mirashki from Georgetown Law School. I had a question about the, uh, when you're building the lists, uh, when people text in their short code with the message justice, for example, uh, you, and you ask for their zip code, you collect, you're collecting, basically you get their phone number and their zip code. Besides asking them for information, what other information are you able to get uh, to amplify? to build these lists, to amplify? Can you figure out their names, their more precise location, other interests? So are you asking, I mean, we ask for, we ask for all of that information. Yeah. Um, besides Outside asking of for asking it, for yeah. It? Like, are you able to take their phone number and, and using other lists and things like that? Uh, the, the, what, what the carrier delivers us mm -hmm. is the rough let long of that, the, 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 we get the name of the carrier. This is what's delivered in the absence. We obviously get the phone number. And we get the rough lat long of the billing address of the phone, um, the rough latitude, longitude of the billing address of the phone, the you know, approximate. It's not always useful or right, but it, sometimes it's the best location possible. Beyond that, um, we don't really get any other information that's not asked for. Now, you could use something like whatchamacallit wrapper or whatever it's called, and then go and try and pay to associate numbers with, it's not something uh, our platform does, but I think there's a way you could associate for money, associate the uh, phone number with other information, but there would be a lot of um, strict limitations on how you could use that information um, going forward, and it's, it's, it's something we, our platform, we don't encourage on our platform, but that would be available, I think. Yep. And second guy in the glasses. Uh, I'm Al Sachs from WMUA uh, in Amherst, Mass. I guess my question was, uh, do you have examples of um, integration of uh, the mobile apps and the reporting in particular with community radios and low power radios and uh, really sort of establishing a uh, more integrated news gathering capacity on a very local um, level. Not not at that lo le level of local. I mean, internationally, I, it sounds like they might. But we have it with public radio. We have a lot of um, we're an increasing amount of use with public radio, but it hasn't, at least in our experience, tra there probably are sort of uh, uh, do-it-yourself examples of that, but not an aggregated example at uh, low-powered radio. I think Jake Shapiro from PRX is back there, and you should talk to him after. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand, Jake. He was anyway. <laughs> I think I turned him away. <laughs> we'll connect you. Why don't we speak up? Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions? Two hands in the back. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff, and I'm not sure I'm going to formulate this question as clearly as, as I'd like to. Um, but this is related to the um, Metro PCS uh, issue, where they are um, not providing full uh, browsing and video capabilities for the lowest um, plan, right? And that's certainly of concern to me, and I'm sure many other people, uh, kind of a redlining of, of the internet for low-income folks. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, uh, while we should go after Metro PCS and figure this out, and I think them fl fl flouting the, uh, the FCC rules is a real problem, um, the reality, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's practical. I mean, the reality is that a lot of low-income folks are on Metro PCS because it's more affordable than AT&T, you know, T-Mobile, and Sprint. So how can we not let those guys off the hook and figure out a strategy, you know, that gets these, these people, you know, full access like everyone else, everyone should have? Uh, that's a great question. The FCC is supposed to be enforcing its rules, period. And, it's, and, and we had hoped and we are continuing to advocate for better rules that would protect users and, and the public from plans like this because it's, these are communications devices and carriers need to be um, operating under certain guidelines about what they can and can't block. And um, I think what it, where we are now is that it's up to us to continue to pressure the FCC and also Congress, because cer certain members of Congress 
are, are paying attention to this, and and there may be legislation introduced that that would address this problem, um, so that either we can write certain neutrality regulations into law, or have the FCC produce something stronger um, that that would explicitly stop this kind of behavior. That's where we're at right now. It's a, it's an uphill climb for sure, but um, there's a lot of people working on it, and you guys should be too. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Robin Brown. I'm from Canada. I work out with uh, our environment department up there. Um, you, in terms of um, uh, the mobile phone being used as a political tool, the, one of the most important groups that we need to get political are, are our students. And I've, I've talking to some American, Americans. I know you guys are having some issues with your school system here. So I'm wondering if you, if you have examples of uh, creative use of the mobile platform in the education sector. There are a number of specific issues that people have used that people have used mobile for in the education sector, particularly uh, K through 12, and I think they'll grow quickly. Um, among them are because of digital divide issues, very often um, reaching parents and getting parents engaged, where parents have previously been written off because they've been hard to reach by email or regularly by phone, are now getting say text messages of what their kids' homework assignment is, what problems with the kids, and you know, the, those kinds of things were using, using the ubiquity and sort of bridge across the digital divide aspect of mobile to bring parents in is, uh, uh, is, is becoming um, more increasingly used and more effective. I mean, just reaching people where they are, just like any other program like that. And what people are, lo and behold, what people are discovering is, oh, these aren't terrible parents. They were just hard to reach and not, and not accessible. So that's, you know, that's one of the issues. Uh, uh, you know, the, all the way to uh, New York City using mobile to engage alumni in its public school program to just bring communities back into having a relationship with the previous schools that they went to. I'm sure there are a number of other examples. I'm just giving the, the ones I can think of off the top of my head of using sort of standard uses for that um, in, in public education. project called Public Media Corps, which uh, connects school, <coughs> community centers, public broadcasting stations together through uh, tech sort of digital native fellows. And we're using mobile in a sh teen issue show that we're doing. Um, so we bring the kids in, we teach them how to make citizen media. We bring them into the studio, we have, uh, have them, we do SMS polls, and um, we're gonna be moving a little bit more into mobile production as well. So. Any other questions? I'm wondering if there's any training that you guys can suggest to people who are interested and sort of don't really know how to jump right into it. I mean, there, there, are, there, there are definitely um, sort of webinars that we do and our competitors do and other people do sort of showing people how to get in. But the, uh, uh, I think the best thing, the best place to start is to look at what the objectives of the organization are and then specifically look for like examples because the use cases are not always totally par uh, parallel. And certainly with all technology, but particularly this, people can waste a lot of time trying to build a mobile program without having it clearly integrated with the existing media reach or objectives of, of their organization. I would just add to that that I would go to the community of people who are working, the, the practice community of people working on mobile. I know that my context is more international, but in terms of the space that I work in, there are meetups, there's Mobile Monday, there is uh, all sorts of different events that you can attend and learn from people who are practitioners in the space, and you'd be surprised where some of the um, inspiration can come from. It doesn't necessarily have to be directly related to the work that you think that you need to be doing. Um, it can be from anywhere along the spectrum, from the private sector to to who knows what, so try to get involved, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot. James, you have a question. <laughs> uh, mobile tracking information. All right, so 
there's an interesting case in Germany. What happens with, with mobile is that we, are, we essentially have a device that's able to either by GPS or by um, cell, cell towers tell us where we are, but also it's information that can be collected by mobile carriers. There was a case recently where a German politician was able to sue for his information and found out his mobile carrier tracked his data location 32,000 times within six months. And when combined with a lot of information available on the web, such as Twitter, are the schedules you have, um, you can actually have a pretty good profile of what someone does over the course of a period with this information. What steps can be taken to, uh, to protect the privacy of individuals with phones in their pockets? I, I can begin with that. I think you might have some things to say, too. Um, and I can only speak broadly about it, but I, I think that there is a balance there between the needs of the carriers to know where you are because they need to make sure that – I mean, the, the, whole, the whole stated purpose of this is to ensure that you have, you know, four bars or whatever, five bars, however many bars your phone has. And, and, and that's good. We want that. Um, but there's got to be a balance between that need and the insane amount of data that they collect on us and, and how closely they can connect it to, to us as individuals. And I think the Guardian Project is, do people know what the Guardian Project is? It's, uh, it's this, this project by, by a couple of, uh, more than a couple, a few very, very smart folks who are, who are trying to open source, create open source um, applications and, and platform built on top of Android um, to provide mobile security for, for users so that it's harder to track you, it's harder to, to, um, to figure out where you are, to figure out what, what websites you're going to, because all that stuff is really out there and open. Uh, and it's not just accessible by the carriers, but it's accessible by people who know how to get that information. Um, so um, this, projects like that, I mean, hopefully there will be more than that so that people can continue to innovate. But people are trying to work that out, but I think it's important to actually call the carriers to task on this and, and ask them exactly what information are you are you getting from us and what information do you need and how can we create some sort of protections? Yeah, um, I think that actually Tosh did a really good job of summarizing that. The Guardian Project I is a really interesting model. Unfortunately, it really is only available at the, at the moment for smartphones and specifically the Android platform. Um, as I mentioned, activists working in this space, I think are confronted by these challenges every day. And, and we recommend, speaking just from sort of a political activist, um, giving advice on security, doing everything from taking your battery out of your mobile phone before you go anywhere sensitive. Um, even when you turn your mobile phone off, the battery is still in it. It can still be remotely activated. There are all sorts of one wonderful, fun, wonderful, not I, one wonderful, um, <laughs> fun, wonderful examples of, uh, of remote um, updates to your to the software, the operating system of your of your mobile. Anybody who's on a network, um, I don't even know if this really exists these days, but the the way that you update the operating system for patches and and, and upgrades and whatnot is actually over the network, and and that can be that can be done, that can be pushed to your mobile so that people can actually turn on your mobile without you necessarily knowing it. They can be used as a recording device um, while you're actually sitting in meetings. And so we say take out your battery, leave your mobile phone at home if you're really concerned about these things. Maybe use multiple phones. Um, the uh, there are some tools for sort of, for sort of what we would call feature phones, and that's right in between a very a dumb phone and a smartphone essentially um, that do do things like uh, in encrypt your SMS and and uh, less exists for voice communications. Um, the more that people move to smartphones and the more that the smartphone community gets engaged in this, the, the more secure we're going to be. But at the moment, uh, it's absolutely true that there's nothing that's secure. And it's not just the carrier tracking. It's also the data that you're sending over their networks. Um, anytime you're surfing the web on your mobile, you're not going over an encrypted connection, chances are. I mean, for certain for certain sites, yes. And for email and whatnot, if you're, if you're being good about that, true. But 90% but of the time, not. And so... Um, yeah, all of that can be scanned and sniffed, and, and people can see exactly what it is, what you're doing, and where you're doing it. Um, and to go back briefly to the question on education, I just got a tweet from someone um, saying that the Philly Student Union and the Media Mobilizing Project are also good resources to figure out how students are using mobile technology to fight for education issues. So, It's the Philly Student Union and the Media Mobilizing Project. I just wanted to mention, if I could, oh, this, this is a question. Um, hi, I'm Rob Williams. I'm from Vermont, uh, Champlain College. The <laughs> I can see you. I'm sorry. Action Coalition for Media Education. Here I am. Great. I'm waving. Okay, I got <laughs> I you. I could tweet at you if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, this has been a really fascinating panel, and, and thanks to you all for, for your wisdom. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this um, new collaborative documentary project called 18 Days in Egypt. Um, it's a pretty interesting um, project. I, I just discovered it a few uh, weeks ago, actually, on Twitter. But um, in terms of mobile, uh, mobile phones and democracy, um, it's a wholly collaborative, hashtag-driven uh, uh, documentary project in which people who are on the ground in Egypt submit um, short video clips of their experiences during the Egyptian uh, uprisings, or call them what you will, uh, via uh, um, video platforms, and then hashtag those particular moments with a place and a date um, of the actual sort of footage. And then these filmmakers are going to sort of pull all that content together and create this documentary called 18 Days in Egypt. And I think it's just a really neat uh, kind of idea in terms of mobile phone technology meets democratic participation. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there into the ether, 18 Days in Egypt. And if you are on Twitter, you can uh, search for that hashtag, uh, 18 Days in Egypt, and find uh, their, their, uh, their Twitter feed. So just a thought. Thanks again for the panel. Great, thank you. Any last questions? Great. Hi, um, thank you. This is not a question, but um, another recommendation for following people who are um, doing educational technology and new media and education. Um, Alan November has um, a website called November Learning, and um, he's at Global Learning on Twitter. Anything else? No. Um, cool. So huh? we're good. Um, so I think we're going to end there, and y'all can come up and ask questions to folks individually. Um, thank you so much for coming out. <laughs>